Abstraction was one of the most significant developments in the story of 20th century art. By breaking free from the direct representation of the world around us, abstract artists created a new visual language and transformed the possibility of what art could be. The story of abstraction in Western art spans the radical geometric paintings of revolutionary Russia to post-war America and the large-scale drips and splodges of Jackson Pollock and New York's abstract expressionists. While in Britain, artists responded to this visual revolution with an astonishing variety of groundbreaking new art. From Barbara Hepworth's naturally inspired forms to Bridget Riley's hard-edged geometric painting and Anthony Caro's industrial steel sculptures, British artists created some of the most pioneering and internationally acclaimed abstract art of the 20th century. And along the way, the BBC has been there to both capture them at work and record their words. I got more and more involved with this idea that it, I wasn't making a human being, but I was making a place where you could go. In this film, we'll delve into the archives to reveal the passionate and dedicated personalities behind the art. It's a life or death thing, you know. I mean, there are good things in it. It's just that I don't quite know how to do it. Rhythm and repetition are at the root of movement. They create a situation within which the most simple, basic forms start to become visually active. And we'll see how abstract art sometimes confounded and even angered those who encountered it. To spend £15,000 on a sculpture that no one really understands is a complete, complete waste of money. So how did the artists that created this challenging new form of art explain their work to the world? If abstract art doesn't describe the world around us, what is it about? It's a question that's often been asked of abstract artists and one which they've all tried to answer in their own words. By the middle of the 20th century, British abstract artists were among the most original working anywhere in the world. Their art rewrote the rules, captured the public imagination, came to stand for the highest of ideals, and used a new language of art that represented a dramatic break from what had gone before. For centuries, people presumed that a painting or a sculpture had to be of something, whether that something was a person or a landscape or an event. But in the 20th century, that idea was turned on its head. Artists began to say, no, our artworks don't need to represent anything. They stand alone. In the first decades of the 20th century, artists in Europe began to create radical forms of abstract art from Malievich's suprematist paintings to Mondrian's simplified arrangements of line and colour. But this wasn't just a new style of painting. It was believed that this kind of art could change society. Both Malievich and Mondrian speak about this desire to create a dynamic kind of uh, society of equal value. So these non-human forms, squares, circles, triangles, lines, seem to offer a kind of purity and also a universality. It was something they felt could be legible to anyone regardless of their language or their nationality or their place in society. But while Europe was going through one of the greatest art upheavals in history, Britain had largely clung to a romantic, figurative tradition. There were, however, a few radical exceptions, and leading them were Ben Nicholson and Barbara Hepworth. At first artistic allies, they became lovers and married in 1938. 
I mean, Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson came together in the early 1930s. Together they moved towards abstraction, and really pretty much exactly the same time, they both arrived at pure abstract art. You know, Barbara at pure abstract sculpture, Ben Nicholson at pure abstract painting and reliefs. So absolutely, they were in intrinsically linked in the 1930s and beyond uh, in their journey into abstraction. While much of British art looked back, Ben Nicholson had forged many links with continental avant-garde artists and developed his own distinctive form of abstract art in response. He was a consummate image maker and every picture was a new problem that required a new solution. And by the mid-1930s, he has made the purest abstract works you'll almost ever see, these white reliefs with just a couple of circles and squares and rectangles. And when I look at those reliefs, I think, wow, those are audacious, those are beautiful. Nicholson was extremely camera shy. In fact, this rare footage of him with Hepworth and their three children is perhaps the only in existence. But it was Hepworth who arguably went on to make a greater impact in the public imagination as an abstract artist. And she was a far more willing participant in front of the camera. In 1961, the BBC travelled to Hepworth's home and studio in St Ives to film her at work. The shapes of our sculptures may remind one of the shapes of hills and trees. Their contours flow in the rhythms of the sea, of the beach, of sand dunes, of birds in flight or of the human figure. Her sculpture may call these things to mind, but it never describes them. Their meaning is ambiguous. It took a long time for me to find my own personal way of making sculpture. A long time to discover the purest forms which would exactly evoke my own sensations and to visualize images which would express the timelessness of primitive forces which I felt, and the constant urges towards survival and growth, which I knew to be fundamental both to the human being and to the landscape in which we stand. Barbara Hepworth was born in 1903 in Wakefield in Yorkshire. She studied with Henry Moore at Leeds College of Art in the mid-1920s, and the two remained friends and rivals throughout their lives. Hepworth began by making figurative sculpture, but in the first half of the 1930s, she made the move into abstraction. In an interview recorded decades later, she described the process she went through. So they gradually became more and more um, abstract, insofar as anatomically they took great uh, latitudes, you know, and tried to, to get everything that was not necessary to my idea, until I got to 29 when I did this torso, which I can't find, called Ivorywood, and uh, that was entirely a suggestion of a figure. It was a, a form which simply had strange undulations, nothing else. And then I thought, suddenly, I've got my own calligraphy now, I know what I have to do. From that point on, Hepworth's art was almost exclusively abstract. And yet her art always remained influenced by the human form and the natural world. She is seen as the maker of the most pure abstract forms. And yet a human presence or the idea of a human figure exists through almost all of her sculptures. When you see in the 1930s, the later 1930s, when she makes these sort of elegant, tapering wooden forms, they still hark back. You know, they Clearly, they have evolved from the standing figure. When you see two forms together, um, there's certainly a metaphorical reference to the idea of two figures 
in sort of harmonious composition, if you like. And I think one of the things that runs through uh, most of Hepworth's art is the use of um, harmonious spatial arrangements as a kind of metaphor or symbol for a human um, harmony. Many people select a stone or a pebble to carry for the day. The weight and form and texture felt in our hands relates us to the past and gives us a sense of a universal force. She loved tactility, the touch of a pebble. She wanted to try and capture how the human form interacted with the wind, with natural forces around it. Perhaps its uh, great strength lies in the fact that it transcends those sources, that she managed to evolve a purity of form which still resonates today. I think any generation, any society can look at those and somehow find a pleasure and a recognition in the textures, the volumes, these very lyrical, rather poetic shapes that she's evolved. In the 1950s and 60s, Hepworth's reputation grew and grew, and in 1968, she had a major retrospective of her work at the Tate Gallery. The BBC was there when a group of Yorkshire schoolchildren visited the exhibition and met the artist. Say it was like a spider's web because the strings are much too thick. Yes, the cross um, effect is looks wonderful, yes. I agree with you there. The first question the children asked her was, why do your sculptures have holes in them? Well, I found out as I worked, and that's a long time ago now, about 1931, that um, by carving right through with a hole, I was able to see the landscape through the hole and see what was happening behind the sculpture right. and be able to put my fingers in my hands. Rounded. In another room, you have a piece of sculpture called square form. This reminds me of being energetic because the squares are piling on top of one another as if it was a race to try and reach the sky and see who became the highest. Am I right or am I wrong, please? You're, you're quite right. Absolutely right. Yes. I didn't realise I liked abstract art until when I was about 15, I was on my own at the Edinburgh Festival, and I got up early one morning, a beautiful sunny morning, and went down to the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, and there's a huge exhibition of Barbara Hepworth there, and I was completely bowled over. I don't think art has to be very complicated or has to be very difficult, and I think it was the purity of her image, her shapes, in that lovely dappled green landscape that just completely entranced me. And I spent hours and hours and hours just walking around, staring at the holes, at the shapes, at the kind of those beautiful biomorphic forms and the complex little lattices inside them and so on. But that was the moment I realised I loved abstract painting, or abstract art, I should say, and it's never left me. Barbara Hepworth has had a huge impact. I mean, she was a really pioneering artist, making the first completely abstract sculpture. She's pretty much as close to a household name as a modern artist can be. You know, Henry Moore, of course, was a hugely important figure uh, in the post-war years, but so too was Barbara Hepworth. And together, I think they did more than almost anyone to, 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 to bring British art to the world, but also to popularise abstraction. And I think... A perfect symbol of her importance in the post-war years is if you uh, look at, um, in the early 1960s, the United Nations commissioned a huge 21-foot-high abstract sculpture to stand in front of the United Nations. And what's interesting about that is they chose Barbara Hepworth. They choose a female artist from Britain living in Cornwall and they choose something abstract. And I think that says a lot. Barbara Hepworth was one of the first British artists to go abstract. But she was soon joined by a very different kind of abstract artist. Victor Passmore, filmed here at his house in Malta by the BBC in 1979, gave up making figurative art